Мне говорят, что Кшиштов на связи, поэтому можем переходить к его докладу. Кшиштов Пачульский нам расскажет про Asset Manager для управления контентом в Unreal Engine. Hi, Кшиштов. Could you start? Hi, can you, can you hear me? I don't hear you. You don't? Oh, okay, no, it's okay. Does it work now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Hi. Hi. You could start. Okay, uh, do you have my slides? Yeah. Okay. So that's great, I think. Uh, okay. So hi, everybody. I'm Krzysztof Pachulski, and I'm going to be talking about asset management in Unreal Engine. Um, so asset manager is something that, uh, I mean, a lot of people are not aware about, but it's, it's, it's in the engine, and it helps a lot with asset loading, with loading times, and, um, and, uh, and helps to organize the async loading for you. So you uh, can we proceed to the next slide? Perfect. Okay, I'm a technical evangelist uh, at Epic Games, so which means that basically I'm the first contact person in the company for you. Uh, my contact that data will be in the end of the, of the presentation. Um, and uh, you can ask me anything. I'm like uh, both technical and also I know the company business. So if you need anything, any answers, you can ask me. I may be able to help you solve your issues, help you answer your questions, whatever it may be. Uh, let's continue, please. Okay, so uh, what will we talk about? Okay, first we'll go to um, some quick notes about references and async loading before we before we can continue to primary and secondary assets. And then we will talk about asset manager and how it helps us manage all the previous stuff. Let's continue. Okay. So references in Unreal, uh, you know, uh, like, like in programming in general, like there are references and we have two types of references in Unreal, which are soft and hard references. Let's continue. Hard references are uh, essentially everything that you create a variable for that is not a simple type, like, you know, float or bool. Uh, and uh, hard, hard references will be um, like basically any, any variable that it creates uh, that uh, has a reference. So if it's a object reference, class reference, uh, if you are using cast nodes, they are also hard references. So as well as in C++, for example, if you use class and a pointer to, to a type. And you can see in, uh, in references, uh, in reference viewer, sorry, uh, you can see the white cables are connecting the references to each other, okay? So this means they are hard references, okay? Let's continue to the next slide. Um, okay, the other type of references is soft references. And this is something that is more of interest to us today. Because soft references help us manage loading a little bit. So with hard references, they are loaded by default whenever the level uh, that has the reference to this uh, hard to this hard reference type, or maybe uh, some other object. Like you know, you you have a blueprint with um, with a variable in it that references other blueprints. So let's say we have a chest, and then we have a weapon that we want to spawn when someone opens the chest. Okay. So if we hold it as a as a regular type of reference, it will load automatically with the level. But what if we want to just load one of 100 weapons that we have in our game? Do we need to load all of them at the start of the map? So we can use object refer soft object references, okay? And soft object references are essentially um, references that the engine is aware of, but it doesn't load by default, okay? So everything that you create of type soft object reference, soft class reference, string reference, or uh, in, um, in C++ it would be T soft object pointer or T soft class pointer. 
uh, there will be sub references created for you. Okay, and then uh, in asset uh, in asset browser, uh, sorry, in uh, asset uh, reference viewer, uh, they will be connected with like purple, purple, pinkish um, arrows, and it helps you distinguish and quickly as uh, quickly see in asset reference uh, viewer uh, which ones are hard and which are which ones are soft. So you will be able to see easily if you are loading a lot of data or maybe not necessarily so you know so you can then optimize or or not okay let's continue to the next slide um okay so if you create soft references they will remain hard dependencies so this is the thing the thing i talked about that the uh, the engine is aware of them being there okay so um so first of all the engine will load the base class that you are uh, that you are using. So if you have a pickup in game, some object that you can pick up, and then you have hundreds and hundreds of objects that the player will be able to pick up. Uh, and if you create, for example, a soft uh, soft class reference, uh, you the engine won't load all the objects that are referenced in this array, for example, but it will just load. Uh, the um, the base class. Okay, so it's good to make your base class as light as possible. Let's continue. And great tool for managing your uh, loading and like seeing what should be optimized, maybe or what you may be missing somewhere, or maybe if somewhere you've done something that generates a lot a lot of loading uh, a lot of loading to the memory, you can use size map. And it's an amazing tool that I was not aware of how amazing it was until I tried it. Uh, the thing is, if you uh, hover on any of the parts of this um, of this uh, window, you can zoom in and you can see with more detail what happens there. Just try it yourself. I would have shown you this, but due to the setup, I can't show you the editor. So let's continue to the next slide. OK, so now. <clears throat> We have soft references, but they are not loaded by default. So how do we make sure that they are in the game when we when we need them? Okay, that the objects are loaded when we need them. Let's continue. Uh, so we have async loading, and async loading helps you load allows you to load the assets on demand. Okay, so you don't need to have the engine make it for you. You can buy your own decide when certain gun or certain pickup object or certain, I don't know, element of your game is loaded. So for example, you can have um, an inventory and you don't want all of the inventory items uh, to be loaded. Like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, like in Fortnite, for example, right? You have, we have tons of guns. You don't want to load them all uh, when the game starts. You want to load them only when player approaches them, okay? Or if any, or if any player uses them. Um, and you should set up your project for async loading as early as possible. This is like you know very important because if your project grows, it will be harder and harder to to maintain it and to change it later. And if you think about it well enough, you can make people use async loading without like, even knowing that they're using async loading. So the only change for them will be that they will load uh, soft references instead of hard references because you can prepare the system that takes soft references and then loads them on demand. So you don't have to really uh, worry about other people not knowing about hard and soft references and stuff. They will just you know, use your system in a manner that you prepared it for them. And uh, this will be like super simple for them. Although you will know that you have the control of loading uh, specific items. So for example, chests again, are a great example of that. If you create a system for chests, you can design it in such a way that it takes soft references. And so other people are, are forced to essentially use it in the way you prepared. And then when someone opens the chest, uh, you have it also covered that it will be loaded for you. Uh, on the here on the bottom, 
you can see the uh, the example of of uh, of how you can load the assets in blueprints. So essentially, you just use async uh, load async load asset. Sorry, uh, async async load asset node in blueprints. And there is one one tiny important detail about this uh, this blueprint. I always connect the the exec the white output to the first exec node uh, exec pin. I would say. And it's not right. Uh, you should actually, like, if you want to use it later, uh, you should connect to complete it because otherwise, um, otherwise you will just continue before the uh, object is loaded, and you want to wait for it to be loaded. Okay, and then we need to cast it to the base class that we want to use, and we can use it right away. Uh, you, if you're using C++, you can async load multiple objects at once. So if you have a more complicated structure, uh, like uh, I don't know, a shop that only delivers certain items, then you can async load only those items mm, that are needed at this point of the game. And this can create the reduced size of maps loaded into memory and essentially it uh, reduces the loading times a lot. And it's super useful for something that is dynamically spawned or decided during the game. So if something is random or if something will be decided based on something else that happened, like, for example, part of the quest will only spawn if another part of the quest was done in a specific way, then you can create it so like not everything is loaded into the game uh, when it's not needed. Let's continue to the next slide, please. OK, so this brings us to Asset Manager and how it helps us. OK, let's, let's continue. So Asset Manager is essentially a singleton so something that is available from anywhere. And it can manage primary assets based on a set of rules. You can also create custom behaviors. <clears throat> and uh, this is like maybe a bit funny note, but like it's involved in cooking process. And I abused it a little bit at, uh, at, at one point. And I just, for example, debugged cooking process using Asset, manage, uh, asset Manager just because I could run some code during the cooking process, and I was sure that it will be uh, running in in this process and not not outside of it. Uh, but the purpose of uh, this Asset Manager being um, uh, being during uh, being involved in cooking process is to manage which objects are cooked in the game and which are not. So this goes even further. It's not only if the assets are uh, needed in the game now, you can also manage if they're cooked. Let's continue to the next slide. So you can create your own asset manager and it's, uh, I would, I would uh, encourage this. Um, if you just need to derive from you asset manager class and it, it needs to be done in C++. There are, tiny little parts of this talk that are, uh, that, are that require C++. Uh, this is one of them, but don't worry about it. A lot of things uh, can be, can be like will be covered in blueprints here. So, so, you know, but this requires C++. So you uh, derive from your asset manager and you can, for example, uh, swap some rules for some, uh, uh, for some objects later. So you need to change the class uh, in general engine general settings, uh, the default class of asset manager to your own asset manager. Okay. Let's continue to the next slide. And now, like if we if we have our asset manager, what what now, right? Uh, there are two types of assets, mm, like not not types as like programming types, but types more like uh, logical types of assets in the engine. Uh, and their primary and secondary assets. Okay, let's continue. And primary assets uh, are managed by the asset manager. This is the important part. Uh, and then those assets manage secondary assets. Okay. So basically, any U object, if you derive, uh, uh, if you uh, sorry, uh, if you uh, have. Uh, a uh, get primary asset ID uh, over written and you return a valid F primary asset ID, uh, this will create, uh, this will like, work as a primary asset. 
you can see in documentation how to create it. It's super simple. Uh, it's just like the only important thing is that, that you do it, okay? It's not how you do it. If you just create the, an override of this function and return a valid uh, primary asset ID, which is basically not empty, so you can just put basically anything in there um, and it will be valid. Uh, then uh, you have your you have made an a uh, primary asset. So, for example, a level is a primary asset by default. Let's continue. So, secondary assets are all other types of assets, and basically the difference, the only difference, is that they are not managed and not able to be managed by asset manager, and they are managed just by the primary assets. Let's continue to the next slide. Okay, so the important part for us will be primary branch because we basically like all all the all the rest will happen on its own without without our uh, engagement. So second so secondary assets will be managed for us by primary assets, but let's talk about the primary ones. Let's continue. Okay, so how to work with primary assets? Uh, essentially, there are two types of primary assets that are available for you by default in the engine. And this is a level. So the map level, however you called it, uh, U world basically, um, and U primary asset label. And you can derive from uh, U primary asset label, label on your own uh, from blueprints. You don't need to use, uh, you don't need to use C++, I think. Um, you just need to select that it's a blueprint class if you if you put it into your asset manager, but I'll tell you about it later. Um, and uh, there is also your primary data asset, and this helps you uh, create um, your custom asset types. So basically, uh, and and they're not uh, not very complicated. They're just like you know, if you if you have a data driven game, this is a great example. Like you create so instead of U data asset, you create a, a U primary data asset, and then you can have this structure be loaded for you by the asset manager. Right? Let's continue. Okay, so what is it useful for, right? So again, let's say you have a shooter game where you have guns, where the items are dropped randomly for you based on some set of whatever logic uh, that you've created. And you have a lot of those guns. And let's let's discuss how we can make it work, okay? Let's continue. Um, yeah, so you can load all of, the, all of the guns at once, which will be probably quite heavy on memory. So when I was checking, uh, one gun that I created myself. It was super simple. It didn't have any particle effects, any just 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 a specific sound and a mesh. So the mesh and textures plus the sound they took like you know over 100 megabytes. So if you have like 100 guns, like you already have over a gigabyte of, of memory taken probably. Uh, so it 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 grows a lot and it grows quick and it like you know load, loading. 100 guns into memory can take a lot of time and you don't want that. Um, okay, so, but but uh, what else can we do? Do you have to, like, for example, right? So, okay, so if we have it done in the other way, do we have to implement everyone in the system? So, like, if you, if, if you want to um, load a random gun, do you have to tell it that, okay, this is an array of random gun, of, of guns, all of, of, all of the guns that we use, um and uh and and do you do you do you want to do you want to like you know every gun that you create put into an array or something like th there is a lot of problems that can be um that can uh, appear if you use this approach right so you probably don't want that uh okay uh and the other problem is okay let's say we have a browser of items or like a shop, something like that. Do you, for example, want to load the whole weapon if you only need an icon? Or maybe will you, to, to omit this problem, 
will you create separately an icon and then a object and another actor, another object for, for the gun itself? Mm, none of those seem to be you know super use, um, super easy to easy to handle later in the game. So like if you need to maintain two assets per ob per logical object in your game, it's quite heavy, you know, you know, in terms of how many problems can appear because of that. Someone can just forget to create, uh, I don't know, an, uh, you, an icon object, right? There are more of problems uh, with those approaches. So asset management kind of deals with them for us. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So there is a <clears throat> an example of, of this. Um, and uh, so you can see there is a kind of variable that holds weapon definitions, OK? So there are data objects, which will help later <clears throat> to generate the weapon for us in the system, OK? And uh, you can see that, OK, I didn't really stress this out, but uh, the blue, dark blue uh, icon is an hard object reference. Let's continue to the next slide. We can change it to the light, uh, light uh, blue uh, color, which means that it's a soft object reference. OK, it is already a, a lot better, but we still need to. Uh, so, so they won't be loaded for us uh, at the beginning of the level or when the, when the object that holds this array is spawned. But they will be just soft object references, which is great. But you still need to add them to some kind of array to to, to you know to um, to randomize from them, and we don't really want that. Uh, let's continue to the next slide. Uh, so why why we won't let the engine handle that, right? Sorry, uh, the example that I'll show will like use data driven development approach, and but you can like create any any other approach you you, you desire. This is just an example. Uh, so don't worry about it. For most of the games that are not completely static, completely uh, linear, this may be useful already. Okay. So let's start to pre with preparing our own primary asset for the weapon. Okay. Let's continue. And I will use your primary data asset. Okay. And if like you're not C++ programmer, don't worry. It may seem scary, scary, but it's not really. So essentially, what what happens here is I create like you know with using a set of uh, variables, I create a weapon definition. Okay, and you can see that uh, on the on the right of our class definition, there is a public U primary data asset, which allows us to uh, to create this primary data asset that will be managed that will be a primary asset type. Okay. So just as you would do with other data assets, just uh, using, mm, we're now using primary data asset instead. And you can see that there are some uh, simple types, which are just created as regular var variables. Uh, so, you know, just some float. I don't care about loading float because float is so simple type. It's, you know, I, I can't even push it to, to the later stage. But uh, this is so small that I don't care about it. Uh, and, uh, and the definition here of the objects are a bit more complex, maybe. But you can see that I'm using tsoft object pointer. So this is the only difference. Uh, and also, what you can see that uh, is that there is a meta uh, sector. And it's, um, it's, it has a meta specifier asset bundles uh, specifier. OK, and you can see that there is uh, the icon will have asset bundle of UI and then all the other parts will have asset bundle of game and asset bundles. I will cover a bit later, but this is the way to categorize your uh, your assets, your especially your soft uh, pointers uh, to the assets. OK, let's continue to the next slide. OK, so now we have our weapon type. Let's Create, let's let know let, let the asset manager know about uh, about our primary asset type. Um, 
Okay, so we just need to go to Game Asset Manager in our project settings and uh, add a primary asset type to scan. And this will essentially tell our asset manager that, hey, there is a type that I want you to look for in the project, in the, in the data, uh, you know, uh, slash game path or like, you know, content of our project. And this, uh, this is, uh, and, and, and like, this, you know, this is a type, this is the name. And here you can, of course, check has blueprint, blueprint classes or is editor only for, um, for sake of, you know, uh, what types are you using or if you want to use them also in the game. So if they will be packaged and uh, also you specify directories where asset managers should, should look for them. So this also gives you a way to organize your project in uh, in in uh, in you know in in some specific in some specific way for you. You have also rules. Uh, there is priority, apply recursively, chunk ID, and cook rule. So you can decide if this should be cooked or not. You can also go further and decide even what assets are loaded. Uh, so, for, for example, you, you can have two directories, like weapons and, for example, weapons prototype or weapons development. And you can decide that the ones under the development or prototype um, folders are not cooked and thus not available in the game, but all the others are cooked and available for the, for, uh, you know, during, during the released game. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so let's let's start using it. Okay, and uh, there is uh, there is a node that is called get primary asset ID list, and the good thing about this is that you can specify the class, the the type, the primary asset type, uh, for 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 this to look for, and it's super super uh, cheap in terms of performance because this just scans or even uses uh, the asset registry for getting your primary assets list without loading them at all. So you can check for your weapons, you can check for some, uh, for, you know, you can look for something already without loading it into memory at all. So this is great in these terms. Okay, like, let's continue to the next slide. Okay, now that we, got our list we can get a random item from this list and now we can check if it has been loaded or not so we do it by using a node called get current bundle state and about bundles we will talk a bit more a bit later uh, let's not get confused but this is how we check the state of of the of the game uh, of the of the object sorry um let's continue to the next to the next slide and if it returned uh, if it returned false we will use async load primary asset uh, let's continue and if it returns true we can this means like it's loaded so we can use instead uh, get object from primary asset okay let's continue so you don't have to use any like if it's loaded you don't have to load or check if it's loaded like you already know that it's there so you can just take your object and it's all right <clears throat> okay so there, there's the full setup what i'm doing here is uh, again i get the primary asset id list so without loading anything i'm getting full list of weapons in my game then i uh, randomize and just get random integer integer from zero to the length minus one because random integer takes max value that is exclusive. Um, we then get current bundle state, which I will describe a bit later. But it essentially gives us an information about uh, about if the object is loaded or not. And then if it's loaded again, I'm not checking anything else. I'm just uh, I'm just casting it straight to my class. Uh, so to okay, so here it's not weapon. I'm sorry. I'm, I, the, this example is this example is by mistake about skins, but this is just another example how you can use it. Um, 
So I loaded my skin, not a weapon, sorry. Uh, and now I'm just, I just cast it to the skin base class. And uh, if it's not loaded, I load it and then cast it to the skin base class. So this is just this chunk of our setup that we have to create to have async loaded for a specific type of asset in specific type of situation. Super simple and it works right away, okay? Just works. <laughs> Let's continue to the next slide. Yeah. Um, okay, so now you can use this data in your weapon system and there are a lot of things that we profited from already, okay? So you are still using the async loading, but the designers don't have to add weapons to any list or to any like, you know, RIs or uh, just the engine finds them for them, okay? When the, it finds the weapons just for them. Uh, you can list all the primary assets without any cost, essentially, almost any cost, of course, but like this is minimal. And you can decide uh, that, for example, weapons from the direct uh, directory that you dis, uh, that you use only for development assets are not cooked, so they won't be in the pack in the final package. And it happens just by default, so you don't have to create any specific uh, extra behaviors or check if it's cooked or uh, I don't know create some weird. Mm, approaches that uh, that will that that you know that that will make you feel safe about it. You just can use this and specify. Okay, please don't cook things under this directory. Thank you, <laughs> and that's it. Uh, and you're quite flexible with with deciding what you want to cook or what or not. Sorry. Let's continue. Okay, let's let's now talk about bundles. Uh, the the title of uh, of it, like maybe uh, a bit covered by my face, but uh, so a bundle is a named list of assets to load as a portion of primary asset. So now we go to another level. We can load just a part of this primary asset definition that we've created. Okay, so if you, for example, just have a menu and you don't have uh, you don't need a mesh or a texture of your gun, you can load just the icon and that's it. And uh, so you specify it, you specify it in such a way by uh, creating a meta specifier with asset bundle specified for you. Uh, so for me, it was asset bundles equals UI and uh, and it's just just here in the U property and that's it i'm done and here i added a note that you shouldn't get confused because even if you're not using bundles the asset manager operates on bundles uh, so you know the default bun the default bundle is 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 the bundle that is loaded if you don't specify any uh, and uh, and if you don't specify the bundle like the asset goes to the default bundle um and uh, it will always be loaded right the default bundle but but uh, you can also like you know have all your uh, soft object pointers be uh, in a bundle okay so if i create a weapon i uh, decide okay this part will be only for menu this part will be only for the game and this will be loaded always because because i want it. okay let's continue to the next slide Okay, and again, we still use the same approach and like basically nothing happens, but now we just gain control on another level of loading. So, uh, and also we've created a system like you're just using engine tools uh, that gives us uh, the flexibility of loading just the things that are needed in the game for us now. And uh, so, you can have the, the you know the description in just one asset. You don't have to divide it for UI part of uh, weapon and then game part of weapon. Just not to load the you know the asset if you are just in the menu. Uh, so you can greatly reduce loading types the times and also uh, greatly reduce uh, the memory usage. And uh, you know just the only thing. You need to make sure 
is is that you I, that you are using only the loaded data okay so how you do it is you specify here uh, in the async load primary asset you specify the bundles that that needs to be loaded and you can set like I here I said just game or I could I could have said just UI or I could have said both of them or none and it will then be loaded all of it okay let's continue to the next slide and here if I have loaded it with this bundle, I can just take this weapon definition that is loaded with this bundle, and I can take weapon mesh soft object reference and just drag it over to the new mesh. And this convert, uh, the selected block uh, node will be created for you. If you want, you can just uh, type convert uh, and it, it will just work. Okay. So it's aware that this is this type. You don't have to cast it even. It just just works that way. It's so easy. You just need to make sure that you are not using anything that was not loaded. If you want icon, you just need to remember that now we uh, we have to add this icon to the bundles that are being loaded for us. Okay, let's continue. So this would be the whole setup. Uh, so get primary asset uh, ID list gets us the list of the assets. Then we randomize and get a random uh, element of this list. And uh, yeah, and I forgot to, to add the bundles here. Uh, but uh, well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I should have specified a bundle in this example. Uh, so for example, uh, a game bundle and then use the skin material. Let's continue to the next slide. So this all gives you uh, more control over loading and cooking process. Uh, you have everything in one place in a nice hierarchy of directories and in a nice organized way uh, created uh, in, uh, in your project and super easy to maintain actually. Uh, so you don't have to worry about a lot of things anymore. Uh, it all happens automatically now, and it helps organize everything and vastly minimizing uh, the loading types times, uh, which is which is the most important part of it and 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 the purpose of of, of this whole. Let's continue to the next uh, slide. Thank you very much. Okay, I see that this is uh, an old old uh, version. I sent uh, another one this morning, and there is my Twitter handle that is now different, and it's. Dalton with five O's in it. Uh, instead, I'm going to write it on the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it, but yep. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I'm not sure how you do quest uh, questions here, but okay. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, it uh, was nice uh, and in chat uh, we have some questions okay mm -hmm. the first one about uh, currently asset changes merging in uh, version control system uh, a pain in the neck will it improve it in the future or unreal engine 5 we are maybe aware Hmm? Okay. Sorry. Maybe do you no, no, use uh, Git plugin? <laughs> it's uh, I, 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 not, I know, I know not a good about. solution. Mm -hmm. So we are aware of that. I'm not sure at this point if anything is if anything is happening because it, this would be a huge change for the engine. But uh, essentially, I I tend to use uh, instead of Git um, instead of Git, I tend to use uh, something that has locking of assets, so Perforce or SVN. Uh, SVN is not ideal, but it still works better with binary assets than Git. Uh, although there is Git and LFS, like la large file system, I think, uh, which essentially, like technically, it should help and it can have locking of, of the uh, <clears throat> locking of the assets implemented as well. But as far as I know, it doesn't work on GitHub in such a way. It works on GitLab or if you host it yourself. So you would need to, you know, create a repository with specific add-ons 
and then uh, and then you could be able to have the same behavior uh, with Git. And there are plugins that you can download somewhere from somewhere in the internet that allow that. Unfortunately, for now, I don't have any ready answer for you that we are going to uh, improve it at this point or at the other. But we are definitely we, we know that uh, that Git isn't the best repository at this point, and it's also the most popular. So we'll probably address it somehow in the future. Okay, thank you from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I, I know. Okay, <laughs> the next uh, question from Ramil uh, Kudashev. What point at app runtime pipeline states generation <laughs> happens for soft reference objects? Does lazy loading well, happen only for memory consuming parts of a set? Texture, vertex, data, sound? Uh, in, 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 when using asset management, like, oh, so, sorry, but the memory, I, I, I can you can you repeat just the last part? Of the yeah, question? okay. What uh, last part or the first? You first, could, you could, what you could point the whole, at yeah. up uh, runtime pipeline runtime, states yeah. generation happens for mm -hmm. soft reference objects? Does lazy loading happen only? for memory consuming parts of a set? If I understand correctly, uh, like if you use soft object references, the whole object will be loaded only when you request it. So if, you, if I understand correctly the question, so this will be the answer. So if you have the soft object reference, it will happen for everything in this object. So it won't, it will just hold a string that is a path to this object in the uh, pack file and this is uh, this is the only the only part that will be uh, this is the only moment where it will uh, okay sorry the only moment where it will start loading it is when you request it. I hope I understood correctly. Okay. Uh, next question from Uno Yakshi. Are mm -hmm. there any situations soft object references is a bad choice? For example, should we use it all over or only for data-driven systems? Okay, so not only for data-driven systems, but it's of course not very useful if you have your level and, for example, you will create uh, every asset on, on the level, you will load dynamically. It will be just too much work for you, too hard to maintain, and also not not super not necessarily helpful because it will still need to get loaded at the beginning of the game. Okay, so uh, just use it for anything that doesn't need to be in the memory at the beginning of the game, and then it may never be loaded. For example, or it's so heavy that you would prefer to load it after the level is already loaded. So, so if for example you have something that. Mm, like like a weapon that that uh, is super complicated and you don't know if the player will ever approach it or if will ever if will ever find it in a chest or something so you can only load it when for example the player approaches a chest that holds it okay or if or maybe you have just a bit longer animation of opening the chest and then you can load it only when the player opens the chest and uh, and this like in those situations, it helps a lot, but in places where, where where you don't need it, where you don't load anything heavy, or if it's just something that is required by the game because this is part of the level, uh, and this is a static content, you don't have to use it. I would I wouldn't suggest uh, doing it all over the place. Just in in places where where you know that uh, that it's not necessary throughout the whole game or it might not even be uh, necessary so like if you have a roguelike game or if you have a shooter game that is not static like call of duty for example but it's more like you know you drop something from chess like in fortnite or like in some roguelike game it's another story than than if you have a game that is a walking simulator and everything is already in the level and um and you just you know interact with with the level you don't want it in the walking simulator, probably, but in anything, in any place, unless maybe in the walking simulator you created different paths that the player can 
uh, can take in terms of um, interactions. So you can just, I don't know, uh, decide that, okay, if the player previously decided that he will talk to this person, then this person will show up in the other part of the level, and then you can async load, or in another level, let's say. So then you can async load this person in the next level or not, if they didn't approach them previously, okay? So this is the example of, of, another, of another thing. Uh, definitely, you could try to use it with AI, right? If you have bots that are spawned, you sometimes spawn just, you know, just one type of enemy, but then maybe, uh, you know, you want to spawn another type of enemy just because the player did something that, that you know, that um, implies in this game that it should spawn another type. But that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Alexander Marchenko. Have you faced any problems using uh, async loading assets with your own asset manager? especially with uh, your custom primary assets and could you provide some information about uh, specific cases and pitfalls you personally catch it so uh, not really but uh, there are some some situations that you should take care of and one of them is uh, like um, Sorry, I, I just don't remember what was the exact setup for this, but sometimes uh, things won't cook, right? Because you, for example, forgot to do something, to uh, to include them somehow in the cooking process. Just make sure that, that all the settings are correct when you when you load them, when you cook them. Uh, also, there is, oh, there is one problem that when I was uh, restarting the level, it wouldn't reload the assets because it considered them uh, them already loaded, so you should. Uh, I just I just don't remember what I did. There. I'm sorry, but yes, there was one problem when I was restarting the level, but this was my mistake. Um, and I would I would I would like to actually take a look at this closer and and remind it myself. And uh, if you would like to write me an email, feel free to. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna find this find this situation and answer you because this was something that actually con uh, concerned me a lot. Um, I just know that when I was restarting the level, not everything was reloaded for me because it considered it loaded. But it was something that I did wrong, and I don't I don't remember what exactly. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Alexander, if you want, uh, please send uh, email to Krzysztof and she shall yeah. provide information for you. Okay, uh, the next question from Artem Avertisov. Can we load assets from DLC without standard loading of DLC into asset registry through this mechanism? So I have like a lot longer version of this talk, which also covers DLCs, um, but it's like, you know, for more than an hour, so I couldn't do it here. But uh, yes, you can do that. And there is an approach that you could use to create DLCs without the regular DLC, uh, you know, pipeline in the engine. And uh, this works in such a way that you create separate chunks. And Asset Manager allows you to create, for example, just a chunk with this asset type. So chunk is essentially a part of uh, a part of the um, game uh, of, of the game assets that is packed to a different pack file, and then you can uh, create a specific behavior. But this is a little bit more complicated. You need to load it at, uh, manually in C if you want to use it as DLC. So there is uh, some information on that in the internet. But yes. Uh, if you create this behavior that loads this pack file for you and like checks, okay, is this pack file in the uh, in the um, in the content? Uh, you know, just just download it, uh, then load it. You know, uh, if you do that, then then yes, you can you can use Asset Manager for creating DLCs. Unfortunately, uh, you can't 
uh, create the code parts like C++ parts of DLC and load them separately as, as DLLs or something. You need to have it in the same um, in the same library. You could technically do that if you had a lot of knowledge about C++ because we have DLL loading uh, behaviors also implemented, but you would need to do it manually, all of it, okay? But all the rest happens basically automatically if you create chunks properly. But this is a bit longer to uh, talk to, uh, to, to describe, so maybe at some other point at some real life conference where we have more time. Okay. And Artem also could uh, write to you, yes? Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. Yeah, okay. I, I have everything on that. Yes. Like, so anyone, if you have anything, like just write to me and we'll see what we can, what, what we can do with that. Okay. Uh, so email is my email. Yeah. Okay. My email uh, is my first name, question. name and then it's gone. Oh yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question from Yelena Lebedeva. It uh, in the blueprint from your slides uh, is not it enough to use only a single load node. As far as she know, <laughs> uh, this node will. Uh, return the asset without loading it if it is already loaded. Yes, because uh, that I, but what I did is I checked if it's loaded, right? So uh, as it, so the async load, <clears throat> yeah, at the very beginning. Okay, you are right. At the very beginning, where I created this um, this first example, I used just async load, and if it is loaded. Then it won't actually. Uh, sorry, if it's loaded, it won't return anything. That's right. But then uh, what I do instead is I check, uh, and I forgot to add it to this example, and, and this is right. I check if it's already loaded, uh, and you can do it with one blueprint node. And then if it is loaded, then I use this async node. And if not, then I use um, just, you know, just take the reference uh, for this and cast it. And you are completely right. And this is exactly what I was trying to, uh, what I forgot about at the very first question that was asked, like the, the question about um, the problems. And this was the problem that I approached. Thank you for that. Uh, I just reminded myself. And I need to re re fix it in this presentation. Thanks. And uh, Yelena, uh has clarify uh, your question. Uh, do we have to check if the asset is low? I think you answer. Yeah. Yes. So, in, so, so this is always a debate. If you have to check everything, if you are sure that it is loaded, and you can trust yourself as a programmer, it's sometimes better in terms of even performance not to check something, but you need to be completely sure. So just prepare some QA tests or something that you can that make that will make sure that you know any no bug can happen. And if it does, just you need to handle it, right? Uh, but uh, but you don't have to if you are sure that it is loaded. You should lo you should check if you want to um, if you want to if, if you don't know if you for example think, okay, maybe someone have already opened another chest and loaded this asset, right? Let's then check. Uh, but if you know for sure that you just loaded it, and this is just another step, then you don't have to check. It. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, are blueprints also could be a soft reference? Yes. It's all questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, next question from Fyodor Chmiliev. Uh, Krzysztof, um, are you going to make any significant changes related to uh, asset management in upcoming uh, Unreal Engine 5 or next Unreal Engine 4 versions? I just... Uh, 
so that uh, some things uh, from your presentation could be not obvious for everybody and probably could be improved somehow as well. Uh, what about backward compatibility? Thank you for a useful presentation. I already found few things to use in my project. Perfect. Th thank you very much. It's great to hear that. Uh, to answer your question, uh, at this point, I'm not aware of any of any changes that are coming, especially big changes. But you are right that there are some things that may not be obvious, and this is basically why I created this presentation to make things a little bit easier. I hope, at least, for some people. Um, but uh, you know what? Actually, let me let me take a look at this. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna see and ask uh, if, if we know anything about about upcoming changes. I can try to contact someone, but. Uh, but the thing is, I would rather not expect anything to change before Unreal Engine 5, and maybe in Unreal Engine 5 something, although we have not announced anything yet, and I also don't know everything about development of this version. Uh, so, uh, so about this part, I have no idea. Although, you asked also about backwards compatibility, and yes, Unreal Engine 5 will be backwards compatible with Unreal Engine 4, and the switch from Unreal Engine 4 Point, like you know the last version that we will release to Unreal Engine 5 should be just a little bit just a little bit uh, more work than uh, than it would be to jump for another to another version <coughs> of Unreal Engine 4 so like if you convert from Unreal Engine 425 to 426 or something like that it will be a bit easier than from Unreal Engine 4 something to Unreal Engine 5 uh, but it will be also also just rather straightforward. So if you have a lot of C++ code created, or uh, like very specific things that are going to be changed, then of course, like, but this is like always, if you do uh, changes to the engine, um, then another, you know, switching to another version is always a little bit of work. So this will be just, just similar. But I wouldn't expect any huge, huge, uh, you know, I wouldn't expect huge work to be required to to update because we are we are aiming for that, especially for the first version. It should be super easy. Okay, uh, and the question from uh, Dmitro Kolskov: Can you make a small recap or share the, the slides? It is definitely better instruction than Unreal Docs and clarification for this question. Current lecture is great. It is better than Unreal Docs and can we have a recap? I think on uh, okay. Unreal Docs site. <laughs> I understand. Um, there are two things then. I'm, uh, I'm going to definitely take a look at the docs and see if we can maybe improve this and and I'll, I'll give it to I'll give the content to, to my guys. Uh, but uh, the thing is I can't at this point share this presentation. I will say I'm going to take a look to follow me on Twitter and I'm going to try to convert this presentation to some uh, materials that can be used as as a blog post or something like that and then have it proof in the company that I can share it. And then I will definitely do so on my blog, on my Twitter, because I'm planning doing okay. that, you know, since I started preparing the presentation, because I also seen that it's not very clear in some places. Okay. Okay. Follow, uh, follow Krzysztof uh, in Twitter yeah. and me. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, question from Alexander Smirnov. Uh, can I use Asset Manager to switch some data blueprints, uh, maybe, uh, depending on a region? For example, uh, use build, uh, you, you say build used uh, different data than Russian. Mm -hmm. this, this makes a lot of sense, and I think yes, although uh, we uh, what I'm sure about is that okay so there are two approaches you can either build uh, the engine for different cultures so um, yeah, there is yeah. another way that is, and uh, you can use localization of assets to do that <clears throat> but if you want you can of course create a system that will have just so so in your primary data asset you will 
for example, have uh, you you can have the bundle that says US or are you, and and then you can use it that way. You just load the bundle that you require, and that's it. Uh, but you will then need to need to uh, name the assets differently as well. So so the, the fields in the in the structure. So it's a little bit of of a it will be a little bit of a hack. Okay. <clears throat> But uh, so this is more to distinguish. So, for example, you can uh, build a, uh, you can build different parts to different chunks with Asset Manager. So, so actually, I mean, you could do that. Okay, <laughs> it's just <laughs> a lot of things that come to my mind at this point that will be like, okay, pros and cons, and there's, it, it's not the way to do that to do that in the engine. Uh, the better way would be to use our localiz localization uh, framework for that. Okay. Um, uh, the next question from Alexey Mission. Uh, can you tell a little more about asset manager usage during cook process? Maybe you can tell a little more about your experience uh, you mentioned uh, during mm -hmm. talk. So yeah, so so there are two two things, right? So the asset manager is also created and it runs during the cook process, and uh, <clears throat> the essential part of this is to using the rules that you specified, direct assets to specific chunks or decide if they are cooked at all. Okay, so this is the the basic usage. And what I did is I couldn't I couldn't understand why certain assets are not cooked. So I started to, to, to debug it in a way, and then uh, I, for example, took a look at asset registry during this process. So essentially, I think in the constructor, in, in some one of the methods of the asset manager that I created, <clears throat> um, I, I, I entered a, uh, I, I put the logic that would um, iterate through asset registry and just Print it all to the log, so I could then take a look at what is cooked and what is not. Also, the other part, uh, the other part of this is uh, this is a little bit outside of your question, but this is also a great tool <clears throat> to debug cooking process. There is a uh, tool called ue4 dot ue4 pack or ue pack dot exe, right? Um, and this is delivered with the engine. Uh, and this basically allows you to unpack your, uh, to unpack your pack files or to list the assets in your pack files. So you can also use this instead. And this helps a lot if, if, you, if you are creating DLCs or if you're de creating any other things. And actually you can even create pack files with this tool without cooking. So if you really want to just check something with one asset, you can just pack this one asset and put it to your game because all the pack files are loaded automatically. Um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of things you can do with that. So this is also covered in the other part of the talk. And I'm gonna to try I'm going to try to create a better like you know a version a written version of this talk uh, and, and share it somewhere soon with this uh, with these tips in mind also. Thank you for the question. Okay, and um, I think the last one, uh, because we don't have uh, more time. Uh, okay, uh, the question from Andrei Pupsev. Sometimes uh, uh, we need to create a U actor component, a component from another U actor component, but in uh, this case, uh, child are uh, not safe change it values size of a uh, box component for example inside the instance this is pack or by design um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that I haven't worked with child actor components for a long a long time uh, and I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. But I remember that at some point I had some problems with child actor component. Although I think they are all the all the problems that I experienced were fixed in, in later releases. 
So I'm not sure about the problem you're describing. Uh, you, you can hit me with the email and, and we can take a look at that. Okay. I can try to, to, to uh, see if I can help. Okay, and now we uh, should to choose the top uh, three best answer uh, questions and maybe do you um... yeah okay. I, I have one yeah. in mind the one that actually pointed out uh, that I made a mistake without like I'm not showing the um, that that's you should also check for for loading uh, for if the asset is loaded before you load it uh, before you try to load it okay so this one from uh, Yelena yes maybe yes yes okay uh, the first and we need more okay uh, let me let me let me recap that um, there was a very long question that uh, that was asking for the uh, for the written version of this, or like for for the slides, and I would like to reward it uh, because like there was some uh, there was some good points. I don't remember those points though, uh, but uh, but yes, but this was a bit longer longer question. Mm. From uh, f uh, lazy loading and something yeah, like this. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. I think so. Yes, f from Ramil Kudashev. I think so. Yeah, okay. And the next one? It's hard to remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. You you, um, you see our chat? Yes, but I don't see any questions in the chat. Wait, let me... You can uh, open the no, lectures. Not main lectures. <gasps> Okay. okay, let me let me quickly check it. I'm not sure. Okay, you sorry, I, I, I didn't use I didn't use the platform. I I, I didn't know. Okay. 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 Uh, but okay. yeah. But wait. Uh, wait. There was one other question uh, about. Um, uh, the it was one of the first ones. M maybe. The, maybe it was the one about the problems, and I liked it a lot. Uh, so at the, at the very beginning, uh, how if I if I know of any problems? The second one or, or the first? One? Uh, Alexander Marchenko, yes, uh, about your personally uh, problem. Yes. All yes. Pitfalls. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Krzysztof. It thank you very it much. It was nice uh, lecture. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. It's nice, nice being with you guys. Have fun. Okay. Hope to see you at some point and in real life. Bye.